Joining me is Dr. Julian Haas, co-founder and president of 10X. Welcome to the show, Julian. Hey, it's always a pleasure to be on. Uh, happy to chat. Excellent. Well, so much has happened since we last spoke almost a year ago, and it's it's been a head-spinning a saga of changes that have happened across the entire crypto landscape. But of course, things have changed with 10X. So let's let's start getting into that. But for a moment, can you let's just give a brief uh, synopsis of what 10X is uh, for, for new listeners. The big picture for 10X is to create a platform that's going to integrate all these different decentralized services that will come in the future. And this is not only finance. I mean, these are healthcare, messaging, identity. There's so many things that are going to come, and we want to build this platform where you can, as a user, have a one stop to access all those. Now, obviously, right now, the most interesting of all those decentralized services is cryptocurrencies. And so when we started in 2004, 15, so three years ago, we focused on making these cryptocurrencies spendable. So we have a debit card where people can load cryptocurrencies on, and then they can use this card to spend their cryptocurrencies. But obviously, that's the first step of a series of steps going forward. And so 10x cards right now, where are they active in the world? I mean, we lost our issuer beginning of uh, January, just like many other companies who have been working with Wavecrest, for example. Um, So since then, we have been, uh, uh, yeah, uh, as radical as possible getting new issuers on. Um, So right now, we are just finalizing uh, deals in the US. Uh, Let's hope we get some good news there quite soon. Um, In Europe, actually, we're getting our own banking license. We're also expecting some good news there soon. And then we can issue cards in Europe ourselves. We don't need a partner. And for Asia, we have been actually working with a partner now for nine months. And we have been waiting for quite some time to get these cards live here. Um, Yeah, so that's kind of the status. So we have around, I don't know, 250,000 people who have had cards and are now patiently, hopefully waiting, uh, some more patiently, some of it less patiently as totally understandable until we can send new cards. Now, in your recent Q1 update video, uh, you brought up this idea of external forces. Uh, I can only imagine the amount of paperwork and red tape that you've had to deal with. Can you describe for a moment these external forces? I mean, is it lawyer related? Is it legislators or regulators or governments? What is it sort of without, you know, getting into the fine granular detail? I mean, so you need to understand if you are a crypto company that wants to make cryptocurrency spendable, obviously you need to, on the one hand, be really good on cryptocurrencies and or on the fiat side. And then if you are only covering one of those areas, you need a partner or partners on the other side. Now, obviously, we are not experts on the fiat side, so we are experts on the crypto side. So we need partners on the fiat side. And there's a lot of partners. Um, It's banks, it's technical technical partners, it's credit card companies, it's issuing companies, um, it's technical processors. And so you need all these different parties And um, many of these companies are quite large. They have been in this game for decades. Um, And so they are the established players. And so we as a small startup need to go to them and we need to convince them that we can do what we are required to do. And there's quite a lot of hoops to jump through. That comes down to KYC, AML, uh, checking source of funds, making sure there's no money laundering, no illegal activity going on. And so what these external forces right now are, and I don't think these partners, and it's not that there's one partner that could point to and say, you are the problem. It's that I think everyone is kind of looking at each other and is not 100% sure who takes reputational risk, who takes compliance risk. And so there's constantly this, okay, look, if this is the line, if you manage to reach this line, we are ready to go. And then we reach this line and then they look at us and say, okay, but we have just seen or heard that this partner says, no, the line should actually be here. And then it's like another foot moving forward. And so it's really, really challenging right now in this environment to kind of get all these puzzle pieces together because it feels like you're holding and juggling all these different things because you need to comply with certain things even though you don't really know what the actual extent is. And so so that's that's kind of the external forces that make it quite a challenge to, to work in the fiat space. Yeah, so they keep moving the goalposts, and 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 Correct. so you keep having to uh, readjust. Yeah, it, that's I, yes, we've seen and that. You see in, this, and, and, and sorry, you see this in the entire ecosystem. I mean, yes. you see this 
all these card issuers or who plan on issuing cards have challenges in this field. It's not only us, right? It's just we feel that right now we've done actually a lot of groundwork, like, for example, getting a financial license in Europe, um, doing a certain audit that really audits our compliance and financial processes to make sure that what we say we're doing is actually what we're doing. So we've done a lot of groundwork now in the past couple of months that we hope are going to help us a lot moving forward. Um, and. And, and, and yeah, and, and, but at the end, it's as long as you always rely on someone else, it's just really, really difficult to kind of predict when can you go live. And this was maybe one of the big mistakes we've done because we've been really confident that we could go live initially. It was before Christmas and then Q1. And we'd always made these predictions that from our side, like this is the goal line, uh, like reach this line and you can go live. And we did, but then things changed, right? And so that's been of the big mistake. And so now we are not giving clear deadlines anymore, not because we don't have internal deadlines. I mean, internally, we have clear deadlines on when these cards should go live, but there's always this expectation from the outside. And this is just something we feel disappoints some people. And I understand that. And we don't want that. We, we want to deliver uh, and we want to work on something and we don't want to appear from the outside as if we are not delivering when actually we're really working on this stuff quite hard. Yes, I, I understand. And, and that's sort of you know, part of the idea that I wanted to get across during this interview is, is that, you know, from interviewing other, other projects and whatnot, the same, same sort of things are happening is that there is this sort of internal frustration because you have external, as you say, external forces that you can't control. And that is, it is really causing you to sort of spin your wheels. At, at the end, right, it comes down to, as I mentioned, reputational and compliance risk. And this is what a lot of these traditional companies want to offload somehow. And I guess the question is just how do you how do they offload that? How do they offload offload not necessarily financial risk, but it's this compliance risk or reputational risk that can cause a lot of financial damage. And so how can they offload that in in some manner? And this is, I think, where there's just a lot of discussion and, and maybe uh, yeah, and, and no one really knows um, how this could work. You're, you, during this time, of course, you have your struggles with whatever uh, partners you're dealing with. But in the meantime, you've been building up your team and, and really growing and expanding. Uh, talk a little bit about that, if you would. I mean, right now we are 60 people. I'm not sure. I think we were 15 or 18 people when we last spoke, which is, I think, yeah, almost a year. But it was like, I think, nine months ago or something. Um, I mean, scaling that is it's a challenge in itself in, in all the hiring you have to do. And obviously you're looking for really good people. So it's not like, okay, for 50 new people, you have 50 meetings. No, you have probably a thousand meetings and, and you need to sift and sort then, and, and, and making sure the culture stays the same. What, what I think what so many people that have never built a company, what they forget is if you are just one person in a boat and you're competing against another person in a boat, all that matters is how fast can you row that boat? And so basically how good is that person? Right. But, as soon as you have two, three, four, 50 people in a boat, it's not necessarily so important that that next person is the best rower. Of course, that person should be really good. But what's almost more important is that that person doesn't row in the wrong direction. And in a company, this is culture. In a company, this is having a similar vision, um, kind of being aligned. And, and these are things that, are, that, that you can't see out of the CV. These are things you actually need to talk to a person about. And this is what I really care about. And, and I, I see myself as this head of culture in a company who really makes sure this is working. And this is, I mean, there's so much effort and energy you have to put into this to, to keep a fantastic culture and, and a great team spirit. Yeah, I think, yes, that's, it's very important. And then the, it's basically like the, the culture is almost fundamental. It's, it's, it's like every other decision has some sort of root in that culture in, in a way. So uh, let's talk for a moment now. You've, you've recent, also so many things have happened, but you've also published a book. And all this time, you've managed to also write and publish a book called Cryptocurrencies. It's available on Amazon. Uh, tell us a little bit about that book. Um, I mean, okay, so the work that I put in there is never ever as much as people might think from the outside. I mean, that book started, I probably would say two and a half years ago when we started Tenex. And I got just frustrated in hiring people or looking for people. And we had a lot of interns back then. I mean, we couldn't afford to pay people. So we had all these interns from university come in. And they had very little clue about cryptocurrencies and the basics. And so I got really frustrated in explaining this stuff over and over again. So I just started writing a little handbook. And it started with very basics. It started with what is a blockchain, what is a cryptocurrency. And then it started expanding. I, I kept adding things over the past years. And so last year, 
I thought, hey, wow, this would be such a great tool for people out there to, on the one hand, learn about cryptocurrencies, which I call like crypto fit. This is like this hashtag that got born out of this. But then obviously also with this way, learn about 10x and, and learn about this mission. And so it wasn't so much work. It was just restructuring it a little bit, adding a few other chapters. Um, it, it was not that I spent hundreds of hours of this last week, uh, last year. It was maybe that, I don't know, I spent maybe two, three hours a week on this. And it was actually quite nice to kind of just like stray my thoughts off from all the meetings and, and yeah, and, and always working with other people and then, yeah, get to sit down and work on something yourself. And uh, well, we launched that book. We launched, I think now it's out in 20 different languages. We have sold over 100,000 copies. It goes through a publisher in Germany who have all this international network. They love that book. I mean, it shot up to number one on Amazon. And obviously, on the one hand, it's fun to see that book doing so well, but we have had so much kickback into 10X from that book because obviously people want to find out more. They want to understand what is it that we do. And I think it was a really great strategy to kind of give value to people uh, and books do this and then do more like a soft marketing for your own company. And I, I would highly recommend anyone um, listening to this, whatever field you're in, to kind of think how could you give value to people and thereby do a soft marketing for your company or for whatever you're doing. I, I didn't write this book only to a soft market. I really wrote this book um, to give value. But yeah, it's, it's always nice to have some 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 win-win-win. Yeah, exactly. Get as much value at, at, at every action you create as possible. Um, all right. So one last final thought, and this is sort of a little bit different than all the others, is, is you know, there's, there's a lot of frustrating, as we've discussed, a lot of frustrating moments. What's sort of a mantra you have or, or sort of like an idea that you express yourself to bring your, to, to remain positive and to, uh, to, be, to be looking upward? I mean, I always believe that it's never as bad as it seems. It's never as good as it seems. Um, sometimes I sit there and I'm like, wow, I can't believe it. We're just flying. I mean, what can stop us, right? And then I kind of remind myself, it's a it's a little quote to have on, on my screen, actually, exactly a quote. And I look at that and I'm like, yeah, you're right. It, it's never as good as it seems. And then during those really terrible times, right, you, you sit there and you're like, no, it's never as bad as it seems. It's somewhere in the middle as always. And um, I think, yeah, if the people come in and they have this kind of philosophy, well, um, you get through these things. And I wouldn't say it's terrible right now. Of course, there's frustrating things, but there's a lot of things under the hood that that we could talk about, right? For example, Comet, a huge network that we're building that we are expecting to get a, a version live soon. So we're really excited about this. Um, we know that there's progress with the issuers. Our token structure that's finally solid and sound. Uh, the team that's constantly growing, uh, the entire structure of the company, making sure that all the finance is finally solid, is uh, we have a proper corporate structure, if you want to call it. I mean, these are all things that you don't see on the front, but we see on the back. And I think it's it's those small successes that you see that kind of keep you going. And, and I think that's really important. Thank you so much, Dr. Julian Haas, the co-founder and president of 10X.